Hello and welcome to this week's edition of World Today from St. Petersburg, where Russia's International Economic Forum was held. Amid tensions across the world, we'll focus on how Russia is planning on tackling Western sanctions as also how China is trying to emulate Russia. Known as Russian Davos, St. Petersburg International Economic Forum saw diminished participation this year owing to the Russia-Ukraine war. While the West boycotted the event, there was participation from major economies like China and India. And the conversations revolved around food and energy security, more so to do with whether if Europe can sustain this winter without Russian gas. Can they? Here's a report. Energy, the big conversation across the globe and at St. Petersburg International Economic Forum as well. Can Europe manage without Russian gas amid the war with Ukraine? Can they recalibrate energy mechanizations from gas to LNG, which will cost countries who are gas dependent hugely and would be a time taking exercise? It's impossible. It's impossible. In Germany, it's uh, more than 40% of uh, gas from the Russians. If we tomorrow close, tomorrow the economic uh, of the Germany close. Okay. So it's impossible? But India is in No, now it's impossible. In future, maybe. But now, in the next several years, I think about three, maybe, maybe even more years, it's impossible. Okay. But for, for Germany, for us, it's possible. Europe is working to reduce its dependence on Russian energy as the war worsens rising oil and gas prices that are fueling record inflation. Gas demand has fallen after the end of the winter heating season, but European utilities are racing to refill storage ahead of next winter with prices high and supplies uncertain. We are already taking a very important step as we have in the morning signed a memorandum of understanding of natural gas delivery from Israel to Egypt, here the liquefying of the gas and then the transport to the European Union. This is a big step forward in the energy supply to Europe, um, but also for Egypt to become a regional energy hub. While the EU is looking at alternatives, Russia's Gazprom has announced a reduction in natural gas flows through a key European pipeline, Nord Stream 1 pipeline, to Germany bringing the overall reduction through the undersea pipeline to 60%, creating further energy turmoil for Europe. To be honest, everybody will understand that it's impossible to stay under the influence for so long. The energy crisis will hit them eventually, and they will come back and apologize so that their citizens can live happily. The Europeans are also suffering due to all these political measures. While the strategy could be to unsettle people and push up prices, a determined Gazprom has told Italian gas giant Eni that it would reduce gas through a different pipeline by roughly 15%. The reduced flows to two of Europe's biggest importers of Russian natural gas follow Russia's previous halt of gas supplies to Bulgaria, Poland, Finland, the Netherlands and Denmark. But at the economic forum in Russia, there was resounding support for those who are standing by Russia with the idea that America and its sanctions can be overcome. They have nothing to do here. If they don't want to, then they shouldn't come. Who do we want? I don't know. I would love Germany and France as friends. While partners are welcome, some have questioned the forum and its participants, like Taliban representatives from Afghanistan. Meanwhile, the European Union has outlined plans to reduce dependence on Russian gas by two-thirds by year's end. Economists say a complete cut-off would deal a severe blow to the economy, consumers and gas-intensive industries. Owing to the war, there has been a growing realization in Russia with Moscow's isolation that there needs to be resilient supply chains within the country and with partner countries. Therefore, I spoke with Russian and Indian businessmen who are looking at collaborating on Putin's Made in Russia and Modi's Make in India.
The Made in Russia and Make in India thrust at St. Petersburg International Economic Forum can be felt in most of the conversations that we're having over here. There's cooperation that both countries are looking at, but there's also the fear of what will happen with the sanctions. I'm being joined over here by Indian and Russian businessmen, and I'll introduce uh, them as and when I go to them. I'll begin with Sun, uh, who is a young entrepreneur in the tech industry. Sun, despite and in spite of the sanctions, we see that you are here in Russia. What does this mean for business and cooperation between the two countries? I think this is a tremendous opportunity and a tremendous time for both the countries, India and Russia, to come together and get their expertise together to actually be able to sustain uh, this strange new time and new reality of the world. I think both countries have enough manpower, uh, enough expertise in technology and business to be able to create uh, the future of humanity, if you will. Uh, Mr. Andre, Mr. Andre, who is uh, with Technological Sovereignty Exports Association, um, just wanted to know whether if uh, you've been a part of the forum, you've seen the kind of uh, cooperation between Russia and the world. This time around, it is more diminished. We don't see a lot of countries participating. Do you feel in the, uh, th that in the kind of cooperation you're looking at, in the kind of market growth that you're looking at, that Russia could feel a little uh, uh, constrained? I don't feel that. Uh, because what we don't see is basically Western countries, and we expected that. But all the world, and for our Indian friends, I can say, all the world that ever had felt colonial power is here. And it's exactly the division between the old colonial West and the rest. And uh, our example of Russian-Indian cooperation is a very good example of that because the potential of Indian-Russian cooperation, especially technological cooperation, is huge because we need each other, we belong to the same technological culture, and we have the same challenge. We have the challenge of building a new technological space in spite of the Western space and in spite of, let's say, uh, large competitors in the East, which are becoming bigger and bigger too. And I think that cooperation is uh, our potential for the future. Russia continues to face the brunt of severe Western sanctions, while China continues to lend a hand of friendship to strengthen trade ties between Beijing and Moscow, the latest being inauguration of a highway bridge between the two countries, which was done with a lot of pomp and circumstance and was broadcast on the national television channels of both the countries. Here's a report. Russia called for a war on Ukraine about three months ago and the move followed the sanctions that US and European Union imposed on Moscow, to which most of the world obliged. But the inauguration of this massive infrastructural development is definitely a well-planned move for Moscow, which is desperate to show it still has friends and trade partners, that too with a fanfare. Last week, Beijing and Moscow launched the first highway bridge over the Amur River, which separates China and Russia for about 1,000 miles. The Blago Westchensk Hehe Bridge connects the twin cities of Hehe in China's Heilongjiang province with Russia's Blago Westchensk in the Far East. And the aim is to clear some 4 million tons of goods and 2 million passengers every year. The bridge is a boost to the Russia-China bilateral ties and both nations symbolize it too. In today's separated world, the Blago Venshes High Hay Bridge between Russia and China has a particularly symbolic meaning. It will become yet another thread of friendship connecting the people of Russia and China. Construction of the bridge started in 2016. Thousands of people were involved in the work that went on round the clock, both on Chinese and Russian side. Construction of the bridge was completed back in 2019, but the inauguration was delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
The bridge spans to the length of 19.9 kilometers, with majority of it on the Russian side. The estimated cost of it is over 369 million US dollars. The highway bridge is not the only link between Beijing and Moscow. There's a railway line extending further east along the Amur and China's Tongjiang city and Russia's Mie Lenin Kyo that will be inaugurated soon. The projects are a part of China's Belt and Road Initiative to create trade corridors linking China to Africa and Eurasia. Moscow earlier showed no intention for allowing large-scale Chinese investments under the program, but the war made Moscow change its stance. The picture in South Asia is much larger than it seems. India is dependent largely upon Moscow for its defense needs, and on the other hand, India's border conflicts with China are still inconclusive. The question here is, will Moscow back India after its strengthened economic ties with Beijing? Or Moscow give up its participation in Beijing's ambitious BRI when the time comes? The Russia-China partnership now goes beyond supporting each other's idea of protecting one's sovereignty. In the latest, Chinese President Xi Jinping has signed an order to emulate Russia's special military operations and carry out the same under the aegis of providing humanitarian aid, assistance, support, infrastructure development, protecting China's sovereignty and development interests. This has raised alarm across the world since China is fighting many battles over what they claim to be Chinese sovereign territory. The order will identify areas for trial outlines for Chinese military to carry out operations beyond the battlefront. Military presence aimed to prevent and neutralize risks and challenges, handle emergencies, protect people and property and safeguard national sovereignty, security, military presence aimed to prevent and neutralize risks and challenges, handle emergencies, protect people and property and safeguard national sovereignty, security and development interests. This could mean using forces in peace operations to create a military stronghold in those countries. While China has been involved in various peacekeeping operations, this seems vastly different from previous roles of Chinese troops. The outlines draw results from both military and civilian research, but aims to provide legal basis for the troops to carry out military operations other than war.